My name is Jan Oltmanns. I'm working for Phobic, a consultancy based in Germany. And the case I've, I'm talking about is uh, for Grupa Zoti. And I'm a bit in a difficult situation because I have two presentations, actually. The first one that you see now is from Grupa Zoti themselves. And I'm trying to pre present their view. And afterwards, you see um, a presentation made by us, how we approached the as exposure assessment in this specific case. So I think we're going to start here with the applicant and the consultants. As you see, it's uh, Grupa Zoti SR. There are different group at Soti legal entities in Poland, so this is important as well. And um, we had the consultants that were us, Phobic from Freiburg in Germany, and RPA from the UK. Just a picture of the nice city of Tarnow, and it's located in the uh, southeast of Poland, about 80 kilometers east from Krakow. That's the uh, group at Soti site in Tarnow, and that's the overview of, of the site. It's quite a big site here um, and there's a specific unit for, for in which uh, trichloral acetylene is used. Oh, uh, picture is not very nice up there. <laughs> the subject of the author authorization was the use of trichloroethylene in the production of caprolactam. And as you see, it's used for uh, polyamide production. So I think these are the elements that I highlighted there are the elements that's probably important for the um, use applied for. You know, that's rather specific uh, use as a process chemical that's defining the function of the chemical here. And importantly, this was a downstream user application. Okay, so overall there was one use at one site. That's why it's an easy example let's say. Um, the advice from Group Soti is that you have to estimate if your substance is subject to authorization and we already heard about the possible exemptions from uh, the need to uh, get authorization for a substance. Um, they also tried to contact the manufacturer and supplier but um, had to do a downstream user application. Um, there's also searching for consortia, obviously, another option. And um, make sure that your dossier covers exactly your use. That's a message they want to convey here. And then at the end, you have to analyze if, if none of the above uh, um, you're able to get, then if you do it yourself, you have to think about do you want to file the application entirely on your own or do you need the help of external consultants? Um, Grupa Azzotti decided to employ um, external consultants and as we heard that was Phobic and RPA. Um, and they had worked with us together in other projects before and they um, considered our expertise and experience uh, in these um, authorization applications um, that are sufficient or <laughs> extensive. Um, it's clear that for them it's not the cheapest possibility to get external consultants on board. But the caprolactam production at their side really is an important one. Um, and the company was satisfied with the decisions they get or the opinions by Rack and Seac uh, with a 12 year review period. Okay, the main challenges, I think that's w probably one of the more important um, slides here for them, is they considered quite a lot of information requirements were hard for them to get. I mean, with the measurements, I, I would talk about that later, but they had a lot of resources allocated to the uh, monitoring and the biomonitoring campaigns. Um, they had a great number of people involved in, in uh, the monitoring campaigns, but also to get all the other information that was necessary. And now from the perspective of a consultant, we were sort of bombarding them with very detailed questions about a lot of different issues. And I will later touch that um, the humans via the environment, because when we're talking about monitoring during these last two days, I think most people have the uh, workers monitoring in mind. 
but the humans via the environment where you have to go to your local sewage treatment plant or something, it's quite a different issue and it's much harder to get and involves a lot of resources as well. So um, time and deadline pressures were an issue for them, even though we had, contrary to, to your suggestion, Hugo, um, about a year, I think, for, for this, you know, one site, one use, but it took us a year. And then um, there are some factors beyond the control of the company as well, and that's also ha having an impact on the pressure uh, they experienced. And internally, there's pressure from the board of directors. And I mean, that's now again my experience that I'm not, I'm not inside the company, but um, for, for the people we talk to as consultants, they want to get the information, they want to help us, but sometimes difficult to get approval from further up. You know. So that was the Grupa Zoti part, and I just go on with the um, exposure assessment part. I can skip most of it, I think, or some of it in the terms of the context. I have one slide on the risk, and then I will focus on the exposure estimation uh, for workers, dermal exposure, inhalation exposure, and as I said already, human exposure by the environment. And then I have one slide on the communication aspects and some discussions and conclusion points. As I said, the example is trichloroethylene um, use as an industrial use as a process chemical in copper lactam purification for Grupa Zoti and Tarnow, Poland. And we had that already. In a way, it's an ideal case. As I said, it's one side and one use, but it's also ideal because we had a biomonitoring method available in this case. So there were many different possibilities to assess exposure. Um, for the CSR, um, we heard there's a dose, you know, the RAC values, like the dose-response relationship, and uh, DNL, in this case, it's a dose-response. But also, you have to derive, you can derive your own dose-response relationship. I call it exposure risk, risk relationship. That's some of the German background, <laughs> probably. Um, and I know, Irvin, you were given the advice not to do it. We did it in this case. But nonetheless, whatever way you look at it, exposure assessment is really the critical point here. Because if you use the rock values, there's not much on the hazard side, so it's all about exposure. Just one slide on the risk for workers' inhalation exposure. The risk, a risk of 1 to 10 to the minus 5 for uh, TCE has been established by RAC for a concentration of 0.8 milligrams per cubic meter based on an assessment of, from 2008 by the German Ausschuss für Gefahrstoffe, AGS. And we did a, uh, our own de derivation in the AFA CSR coming to a concentration of 3 milligrams per cubic meter based on the same methodology but taking more recent data into account. At this point, I think it's important that if you have the values derived by RAC and you're looking for monitoring methods, as early as possible get an idea about the limit of detection of the monitoring methods. Over here you see, for example, oh, where am I? Okay, the air monitoring had a limit of detection of five milligrams per cubic meter. And as you see, if you if all are below the limit of detection, it's difficult to relate that to the risk. Okay, we felt that the exposure risk relationship or dose response established by RAC was outdated and uh, we did our own exposure risk relationship um, considering more recent data. Um, we presented both in the CSR and used them for risk calculation and 
from the RUC opinion we took that they, it was based only on the, on the RUC dose response values. So the take home message for us is the next time we want to do it and propose it to our clients and they agree to go for a known exposure risk relationship, then it's probably not presenting it side by side, you know, both values, but rather only your own. But I think you're losing sort of the, you're losing information because um, I think that it also gives an idea about the uncertainty of the risk that you, that you calculate. And over here you see up there it's up to factor almost four what the difference is. Okay, okay dermal exposure for workers. The, I mean, trichloroethylene, it's a highly volatile solvent, so that's where we started with our initial thinking about it. And you have in the <coughs> ECHA guidance on information requirements and chemical safety assessment for the occupational exposure assessment, you have a, an equation where you can calculate the evaporation time. And we calculated that to be in the order of 0.5 to 5 seconds you know, from gloves. So the idea was it evaporates very fast, but we couldn't translate that directly into dermal exposure. So we did several calculations and assumed complete glove penetration and then had um, <coughs> an estimate based on the flux under occlusive conditions, which means inside the glove. And we compared that to the inhalation exposure that we estimated for the workers at this site for this use. And we found that it's less than 0.2% of the total exposure was related to dermal exposure. We did other calculations with a software tool developed by the U.S. National Institutes of Occupational Safety and Health, and which not only gives you the evaporation, but also the dermal absorption of the substance. And then we found that 0.01% um, was predicted to be absorbed through the skin. So we had 0.1%, 10 times higher to account for some uncertainty in these um, modeled estimates um, as an absorption in this calculation based on ECTOC TRA and we found that the dermal exposure is contributing you know, less than 0.1% to the total exposure. So overall, we concluded that the high volatility results in negligible dermal exposure in this use. I mean, obviously, if you have a use or a specific task in a specific use where, I mean, I find this hard to imagine, but where you have immersion of your hands into into the liquid, then evaporation is not possible. So you can't apply this, these calculations. So it's, it's sort of uh, the substance properties combined with a specific use, or more precisely, with a specific task, you can do these sort of calculations. But it's not a general sort of thing that you can always apply. I think that's where it gets very specific and very into the details. You have to know the workplace and how, how tasks are performed. And from the RUC opinion, I take that they accepted this, this uh, rationale. But there's also in this case, because we had the biomonitoring values as well, which cover dermal exposure also, it's sort of you're on the safe side in a way. Um, if you don't have the biomonitoring, it's probably, I don't know how RUC will evaluate that, but um, if you, because then it's based on calculations alone. But I think it's one of the, you know, always important to, to clearly have the, the physical chemical properties of your substance in mind. I mean, it sounds trivial, but yeah, it's important. The inhalation exposure, I mean, first thing we always ask when we come to companies, um, do you have available data? I mean, under the carcinogens and mutagens at work directive, you're supposed to have data available on the exposure to carcinogens. 
But then it's sort of like, um, in this case, they had gas sensors, but they were set to the Polish OEL, I mean, which is the law in the country. So that's the way they do it. And of course, this value of 50 milligrams per cubic meter is not appropriate for an exposure assessment covering the risk from carcinogenic effects. So we designed, let's say, a new biomonitoring campaign for all workers from all five teams collecting urine at the end of the work shift. So we had 15 workers in total. At this point, we said we need a control group as well because there might be, you know, some exposure unrelated to the um, use of the substance. And we also had in mind at this stage um, to use these control group administrative stuff from, from the site, but not exposed to trichloroethylene, for the human by the <coughs> environment exposure assessment. Then we had a new air monitoring campaign with personal sampling um, with all workers from three teams, slightly less than for the biomonitoring. Um, it's also important that we, at this stage, we said the air monitoring was in the same week after which we collected the urine from the workers, you know, so that they could be related in some way to, to the uh, same task or same work. And we also did modeling with the advanced reach tool, ART. Um, in a way, we had a small number of samples is true, but because there's a small number of workers exposed. So for a specific task, like taking a sample, we also performed art modeling. Um, it allows to identify specific tasks associated with exposure, especially if you, if you have the air monitoring, it's over six hours or eight hours, and it's sort of an aggregated value, but you don't know which tasks are really related to this exposure. And um, we also do it really prior to monitoring. I think it's useful to get an idea at the beginning, what are my tasks that are potentially associated with exposure? So if you then go to the company, you could actually see, well, this task, this task. And in some ways, more generally speaking, you're able to identify these tasks before you do any monitoring. I mean, that's maybe an impact of the, of the authorization procedure that companies review the processes and the tasks and identify areas where there's room for improvement. And sometimes it's really low tech. It doesn't cost a million all the time. It's sometimes very easy measures which um, can reduce exposure. Just as an example, do you really need this amount of sampling? Do you need, really need these number of samples, or can that be done differently? Okay, so we had three approaches, biomonitoring, air monitoring, and art modeling, but it will not always be possible, simply because you don't have a biomonitoring method, for example, or maybe the air monitoring is not sufficient in terms of the limit of detection. So in a way, that's ideal to have all these three um, methods of exposure assessment. And we used them all. So the modeling results um, generally confirm measured data. The air monitoring was supportive of the biomonitoring, but there were some unexplained findings, and maybe that's <laughs> some of these things, once you start measuring, you never get ideal results. And, but then it's, everyone, you said, uh, the simpler the better. I think then these findings require some discussion, and it's not simple, it's very difficult, and I think we tried in this dossier to, let's say, play with open cards. We said we have something which we can't explain, there's some difference here between these two lab workers, which we can't explain. We have high air monitoring, but the biomonitoring is below the limit of detection. We don't know why. And for the company, I think it's uh, also a chance to identify these areas where they need to 
um, have a closer look. Is the fume cupboard maybe not working properly or something like that? You know, it's and I think we we made that clear in the CSR. And my feeling or my understanding was that it's also um, appreciated by RAC if you present your case, even if you get high values in some cases here, um, discuss them openly, what could be the reasons for it, rather than trying to hide this or not, you know, not showing all the values or whatever. Um, we consider the biomonitoring data most reliable because they don't have to make an assumption on the efficiency of respiratory protective equipment. For air monitoring, because it's an external value, you always have to make an assumption on the efficiency during specific tasks. Um, the biomonitoring data also integrate exposure over the entire work week, so they reflect some variability you know, might be higher exposures during one day and not so high during the other day. And um, we consider them overall to be more consistent. And as I said, we, we consider dermal exposure to be negligible, but um, this would also be covered by the biomonitoring data. And of course, we had the highest number of samples, all workers from all teams. And in the rock opinion, um, I think they followed this argument, but considered, quote, the data set small, only a single measurement for each worker. And I think there's probably the two ways looking at it. Um, my interpretation or our point of view would be we measured every single worker. You know, so it's sort of looking at the same thing from uh, different perspectives. And um, I think in the opinion, there's also the yearly measurements, as you said, yesterday yearly monitoring and I think that's fine and I think it gives the company also the opportunity to check whether you know their, their review of, of processes or whatever is successful and given a more consistent picture. I have here the results maybe that's I don't know if that's too far but um, I just want to point out from the air monitoring the maximum value that we measured was 11 milligrams per cubic meter and Further down below, you see the comparison data from Germany, 2000 to 2010, the arithmetic mean is 110, so 10 times higher. So I think, I mean, that's not nothing to do with the actual exposure in this use, but it gives you, or it gives Ruck maybe an idea, these exposure, exposures here are quite low. And then finally, as I said, we based the assessment on the biomonitoring data, and that was followed by RAC, although um, they did not follow our correction for, the, for some infrequent uses, but, but, but still think, um, uh, took our estimate because the difference was rather small, as you see there. Humans by the environment. Um, as I said, maybe it's not sometimes so much in the focus, but potentially there's much higher population exposed, exposed to the concentrations um, that you estimate here. So I think there should be much or a lot of effort put into um, an assessment of human exposure via the environment as well. And as I said, we took the uh, biomonitoring con controls uh, from the site in here as well. They were about 250 to 300 meters from the unit where uh, TCE was used. Well, it's a small number of samples, only five, I admit, yeah, but still it gives you an idea. And we had additional air monitoring off-site, one to four kilometers um, from the site. In addition, we perform modeling at the local scale. And for modeling, the, of course, the input data are crucial. And for the emissions to um, wastewater or release with the effluent, really, um, we took data from the EPRTR, that is the Pollutant Release and Transfer Register, and um, not for the company, they are not reporting, they don't have to report, but from the municipal STP. And that's why they say at the beginning you sometimes have to go to 
to other people, not on your site, not within your company, but somebody else. So this municipal STP reported trichloroethylene emissions into the river. And mind you, there's an, it's a regulation, it's European law, it's the EPRTR regulation. Companies have to report when they emit certain substances above a specific limit. For many of these, it's about uh, 10 kilograms for emissions to wastewater and I think 1,000 kilograms for emissions to air per year. So what we regularly do then is for a company look in the EPRTR um, register if they report emissions because one, that could be a basis for the um, input for the human exposure via the environment and two, as an authority, I would have a, I would go there as well, you know, and, and look, and if the company says we, we have no emissions to air, which, you know, some people sometimes think that they don't have any, but their company is reporting to the EPRTR, then I think, I mean, you made something wrong. So that's maybe an important piece of information here, but your company, even your site, may report but it has nothing to do with the use you apply for. So you have to talk with a, have to be very clear, are these emissions that we report on the EPRTR are coming from this use or for, from a different use? Okay. Um, again, data on discharge rates are from Krupa Zoti themselves and we heard that earlier. It's always complicated. We talk to the REACH people, but it's the environmental unit or some, you know, permitting unit or something else. Uh, there are different units involved in the company, and much of the time that is needed, I think, is coordination between the different units, getting the data. No, we, we don't need simply the arithmetic mean. We need the number of samples, the range, and percentiles, and whatever. So they're going back again, asking for different data. That takes a lot of time, from my experience at least. Um, releases to air were based on an integrated permit that the company had. And we put, tried to put as much detail as possible of the Polish documents in an annex in this case, and then perform the uses modeling. Uh, simplified for one sewage treatment plant, they have one on the side, and the one I was referring to, the municipal one, which is, that's complicated and it's almost impossible to model it in uses, so we had a somewhat simplified procedure here. And the outcome, as you see here, or probably you can't see it, so I would tell you, um, the measured data were all below the limit of detection, and that gives us somewhere in the lower or below 69 micrograms or below 14.6 micrograms per cubic meter. And the modeling resulted in TCE concentration in air and 0.088 micrograms per cubic meter and total oral intake of 0.01 micrograms per kilograms per day. So this is what you get at the end, and this, of course, um, is then related to the risks, which you see here, which are, um, as I said, this assessment means based on the exposure risk relationship that we derived in the CSR, and the ECHA 2014 is the um, ECHA dose response. But the overall, it's a, the risk is about a 10 to the 1 to 10 to the minus 9 to about 6 to 10 to the minus 9. So. We consider these very low risks, even under extremely conservative <coughs> modeling assumptions, since the local assessment assumes that inhalation occurs 100 meters from the source, which I showed you the Grupa Soti site at the beginning, at the first slide and first presentation. The slide is very big and there's nobody living 100 meters from the source in this case. And oral exposure assumes that all food items come from the vicinity of the site, which is hard to disprove, but <laughs> it's, um, yeah, certainly a very conservative assumption, especially if you combine the two and add up the risks. And RUC certainly acknowledged the potential overestimates, but then calculated risk for the entire population of the city of Tarno. And um, 
you see, then you end up with a different risk figure, and they still consider this low, but my impression was there's no hard figure when is it low and when is it not low after multiplication with the um, population. So I think that um, humans by the environment, because I, I know from experience and, and many people who read um, risk assessment reports, the old ones, um, realize there's in the uses there are some very conservative and assumptions that have been um, changed or not changed but um, disproven by um, valid experimental data. I think we would all benefit from an update of the user software, but I don't know if that's uh, coming at our age. Um, I have some communication aspects as well. Of course, you have Group Outsorti as the applicant for authorization, uh, who are in contact and with ECHA and later then with RUC. You have the AOA and uh, CEA by uh, RPA in this key, uh, case, our colleagues with which we cooperate for a long time on these issues, and the CSR was prepared by ourselves. There's also s very strong communication between RPA and ourselves, obviously. I mean, just a, one example, if the process description in the CEA and the process description in the CSR are <coughs> different, <laughs> it's probably a problem. We had very intensive communication with the company and among our consultants. We had three meetings at the site, our site visits as well, within six months. So it's clear you have to see the site in order to do a modeling. You cannot, it's my opinion, you cannot do it from the office. <laughs> I mean, in these cases. A uh, very detailed exchange of information. There are different units within the company involved. Um, language is an issue sometimes. You know, I mean, it's all in, in English. But then if you talk to the engineers or somebody, even if you talk to a worker down, down there who's handling the substance, you have to make sure that you have proper translation. And sometimes it's very important. Is that really the worker who is doing this? Or is it somebody else, you know, a maintenance worker from outside or whatever? Mm -hmm very detailed and you have to make sure you have proper proper translation in place. Discussion and conclusions. As I said, I mean in many cases it will be uh, the values derived by RUC, but I wouldn't be so pessimistic about your own. I think there are cases when you argue, you know, threshold, non-threshold, it's probably very tough uh, to get it through. But if you, if you have, an, as in our case, I think we had an old um, dose response, I say, based on an old value from 2008, and we applied the same methodology as the one used by RUC, but just with different input data based on new estimates, new, especially exposure estimates. Um, there are several approaches to exposure estimation that are useful and my personal opinion is it's useful to apply as many as possible because every approach has its advantages and disadvantages. Biomonitoring is obviously, um, to my mind, the method of choice because it integrates all pathways, it generally integrates the over a longer period of time than a measurement on a single day, a monitoring measurement on a single day. And also you don't have to make assumptions on the um, effective or efficiency of um, um, personal protective equipment. Air monitoring, of course, is also um, important, but mind you, um, as I said in the beginning, make sure you know the limit of detection of your method and for the chromium-6 compounds, for example, uh, you don't get a reliable personal monitoring method for the concentrations um, um, corresponding to the 10 to the mi minus 5 risk level. So you need some other air monitoring approaches. Um, of course, the more measurements you have, the more discussion you need to include in your CSR, the simpler, the better. Again, these are points here where I think a more detailed discussion is, is well in place. Of course, if you're happy and all the monitoring data give the same result, when, um, yeah, that's a good case, but I don't think it will happen in reality. 
Of course, there are costs involved uh, with all this, but um, I think you have to show that you really assess the exposure in death. <coughs> Dermal exposure might be for high volatility solvents negligible in certain users or tasks, um, but of course this requires detailed justification. And I would say exposure of human exposure by the environment, the local scale is in my mind potentially unrealistic but uh, I don't really have a workaround here. But I think that should be, it's not only over conservative, I think, I think it's unrealistic, but that probably requires uh, more discussion at other places. Of course, very good communication is crucial uh, as always, but here as well, especially if you have, you know, the company and consultants and different consultants involved, that's very important. Um, I have to make some credits to all the Kuba Tsoti people, the REACH people, the site manager, unit managers, engineers, of course all the workers and staff taking part in the air monitoring and biomonitoring campaigns, my colleagues from FOWIC and RPA of course as well. And that's the final picture, it's for me, it's, I don't know if I have the, some sort of vis visualization of the point estimate there in the middle with some clouds around or some foggy um, situations. So that was it for me.